Good morning, church. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Jason. I am one of the pastors here at Eastside Community Church. And I just want to take a moment to thank you for joining us today, wherever you find yourself across the city. Right now, we are taking a two-week break from in-person meetings. And so all across the city, and in fact, all across the country, we have people joining us. And so even right now on the live chat, maybe just drop your name, say hi to everyone, tell us where you are, 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 sh- are coming in from. We would love to be able to connect with you, know that you are there. Um, And we're going to be heading into worship right now. But before we do, I would like us to take a moment to really just center ourselves in on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so wherever you find yourself, um, in whatever position you are in, whether you are running on the treadmill, whether you're lying in bed, whether you're sitting on the couch, um, in the lounge with your family, I would like to ask you to take a moment simply to pause what you are doing to perhaps stand where you are, and for us just to take a moment to center ourselves on Christ as we go in to worship. And so wherever you are, I'd like to ask you to stand, and why don't we just pray together, take a moment to, to turn our eyes to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, as we enter into this worship and our time together in the Word. And so Father God, we just want to take a moment to recognize you. You are as as the Word of God says, the author and the perfecter Jesus. As we lift our eyes to you, we focus in on you. And Lord God, as we begin to enter a time of worship, of songs that just declare your praises and and center our hearts in your presence, Lord God, I pray that you'd fill every single room, every single place, every every situation that we are in, where we are meeting, when we are meeting, God, may you Be with us. May you bless our time together as we turn our attention to you and worship you. And all God's people said across the city, amen. Guys, I hope you have a great time in worship. Let's focus in on Jesus. See 
So, Father God, we just want to take a moment wherever we find ourselves right now. And we want to open ourselves up to your presence. And we want to invite you, Father God, to make yourself known to us. May you pour your spirit out upon us as individuals, as as family, as friends, as a church, as a community, and even, Lord, as a country. May you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. May you bring revival, may you bring renewal wherever we find ourselves the most depleted and the most in need of you. May you bless us, Father God, may you keep us, may your face shine upon us, Lord. In your mighty name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey church, we, we're going to take a moment right now to continue in our act of worship and one way that we do that, one way that we continue in our act of worship as a community is through our tithe and through our offering. 
And as I was preparing for this moment right now, I was reminded of a scripture that's kind of been playing in my mind over the past couple of weeks. Um, And that's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which speaks about faith. It speaks about faith, and this is what it says. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith, this is the definition, is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Now, when, when I think of that verse and when I think of tithe and offerings, I often actually think of the reality of what that act is. It's an act of faith, especially in the times that we find ourselves in right now where our futures aren't certain. There is an uncertainty where our financial situation might be uncertain. Uh, you see, a, a, a couple of years back, um, Abigail and I found ourselves in a, a very tight financial situation. And it, it literally came down to the fact that if I gave tithe, we would be in, like we would be in trouble. And I remember sitting and wrestling and, and praying it through. And I felt God inviting me into a moment of trusting Him. Inviting me into a moment of, of an act of faith where, where He said, Trust me with your finances. Trust me with this tithe. Do, do this thing out of this conviction, do this thing out of, out of a trust and faith in me. And, and as I did, I felt a release in the spiritual realm. I felt God's blessing turn out. And you know what actually happened? By the end of that month, we were fine. We were perfectly fine. And, and for me, it was just a moment of, of, of God saying, Hey, Jay, I've got you wherever you are. I want to bless you, but, but honor me in your finances. Honor me with this. And so wherever you find yourself, just for a moment, as, as you think about your tithe, as you think about your offering, think about it being an act of faith, an assurance of the things you hope for, and the conviction of the things that aren't seen. And so we're going to take a moment. You'll, you'll see a, a clip coming up on your screen that will tell you how you can give tithe and offerings during this time. But we're not giving bags around. Um, but as we do, I want to ask you to allow this moment to be a moment where you say, Lord, Accept my act of worship. Accept my act of faith. I'm entrusting you with this, Jesus. So let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you that you are who you say you are. That you, you are our provider, Jehovah Jireh. You are. God, you're the one who gives us all that we need. You're the one who said that, that you will clothe the, the, the fields with flowers and you provide the birds of the air with the food that they have. How much more would you do for us as, as, as your children? And, and Father God, right now as we give our, our tithe and we give our offering as an act of worship, as an act of faith, may you receive it, Lord. And Lord, may you bless it. May you use it for your kingdom. And you, may you bless us through it, Lord. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. We have made it as easy as possible for you to give to the Ministry of Eastside. To use SnapScan, use your phone camera to scan the code at the bottom of the screen and you'll be directed to the Eastside SnapScan account on your app. Or head over to myecc.co.za and click on the SnapScan link. If you prefer to give via EFT, you can find our banking details at myecc.co.za. Thank you for partnering with us in ministry. Are you visiting? Do you have a question or comment? Would you like to share a prayer request? The Connect card is the best way to connect with us. Let us know you're visiting, find out about opportunities to get involved, respond to any announcement you hear today. Whatever's on your mind, share it with us via the Connect card at myecc.co.za. Are you new to Eastside? Or maybe you've been here a while, but you're thinking, what are my next steps? Well, your next steps is the Next Steps class, which starts soon. At the Next Steps class, you'll hear the Eastside story, find out how you can flourish at Eastside, and have the opportunity to become a member. Register for the Next Steps course at myecc.co.za today. For some time, we've asked you to join our Take Them a Meal team, and we've heard you. You'd love to make a meal, but delivering it can be a challenge. So now you can also bring them a meal. Make a frozen meal and drop it off at the Connect Cafe on Sunday. And when someone is in need, our church team will deliver it to someone with a need. Bring them a meal, help them heal. Like Martin Luther King, we too have a dream. At Eastside, we want to be the most welcoming church in town. Will you help us make that a reality by joining the Connect team? The Connect team welcome people as they arrive, help them get checked in and seated, and connect with visitors after the service. To be part of the Connect team, RSVP to join the team at myecc.co.za via the Connect card, attend the next team meeting, 
and only serve every three weeks. Let's make this dream a reality together. Eastside, the most welcoming church in town. Hi there, church. Hey, man, crazy times, isn't it? Um, I really had hoped that we wouldn't have to just be online again, but that's the way it is today. But isn't it wonderful that God has given us the ability and the equipment to be able to do this. And that's because so many of you guys have been faithful in your giving. And <clears throat> I just want you to know, I appreciate the way that you guys are serving. I think the other thing that is really encouraging to me is how many of you are reaching out to those of the people in our church who have COVID and families who are affected in some way or another. So thank you so much for being the church of Jesus Christ in spite of the fact that we can't meet. Having said that, why don't we open a word of prayer and then we're going to get straight into God's word. Lord God, I thank you. I just thank you for what we have, Lord. For the way in which you've blessed our church. For how people in our church are being a blessing to other people. And Lord, as, as I bring your word this morning, I pray that you would let the words of my mouth and wherever people find themselves, let their hearts be receptive. Anoint my words, Lord. Let it, let it be words from your mouth, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, today I want to speak about the one thing that keeps you from God. Um, the one thing that makes you feel terrible about yourself. Um, so why don't we read together from this Bible passage um, in Zechariah chapter 3. Let's read together. Then the angel showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebukes you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is not this man a firebrand snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy garments as he stood before the angel. So the angel said to those standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have removed your iniquity, and I will clothe you with splendid robes. Then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So a clean turban was placed on his head, and they clothed him as the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord of hosts says. If you walk in my ways and keep my instructions, then you will govern my house and will also have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place Amongst these who are standing here. Hear now, O high priest Joshua, you and your companions seated before you, who are indeed a sign. For behold, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone I have set before Joshua. On that one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave on it an inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, you will each invite your neighbor to sit under your own vine and fig tree. Now, to try and understand the prophet of Zechariah, one needs to understand a little bit about prophetic language. So on the one hand, there's a lot of symbolism around, I mean, if you read chapter 1, 2, and 3, and 4, um, a lot of symbolism. If you go further, you go into the prophecy the, the more difficult it becomes to try and unpack what is being said. But the first couple of chapters is, is, is quite easy to understand if you just took a little bit of time and just understood that what the prophet was actually doing was he was telling what God, he's telling the story of what God had revealed to him about Israel, about a group of people who had come all the way from Babylon into Jerusalem, and they were now tasked with rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple. And in this particular chapter, um, there are two people that are, that are key. 
at Zerubbabel, and it's this guy called Joshua. In fact, they seem to always be mentioned together, and God makes it clear that they will rebuild the temple. Um, now, if you read the minor prophets, many of the minor, and they minor, I've said this before, the minor prophets are minor because not because they're less than, simply because they have less chapters. So you have Isaiah who has so many chapters, and then you have Zechariah who has so many. And then, of course, we looked at Haggai for, for two weeks. They only have, he only has two chapters. So, um, so in all of these minor prophets, you have these significant people who are called by God to do something amazing. So you have Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra the scribe is called in by King Cyrus to go with this, a group of about 42 people to go and rebuild the temple. Then Nehemiah goes to the king and he says, God has called me to go and rebuild the walls. And in this, in this particular book, it's Zerubbabel the governor. He's the governor like Nehemiah was. And then there's Joshua. Joshua is actually the pastor, the high priest. Um, at the start of any project, um, one, um, one always has to, um, I'm sure one wonders how things would turn out. And when I spoke through the prophet Haggai, I, I mentioned to you one Sunday, people would walk past the ruins of the temple in Jerusalem and they would, they would wonder to themselves. You know? I mean, Solomon's temple was so amazing, what we have now, can't even be close to that. It'll never be as good as that. And so many of these people came back with great aspirations, great dreams, called by God, and they had questions. Now, I just want to say this. In order to do amazing things, God always raises up leaders. God raises up craftsmen, as He does on this occasion. The leaders could have led well if there were no craftsmen, Neither the wall nor the temple would have been rebuilt. Businessmen. I mean, you have to ask the question, okay, I know the king of Babylon provided a lot of resources, but I am sure that as industry took off in Jerusalem, God tapped a few of these businessmen on the shoulder and said, listen, everything that I have allowed you to make is not for yourself. It is there for the advancement of the kingdom. And so people would have given sacrificially, businessmen. And then there were the spiritual works, like Joshua and Ezra and others. Um, they were the get-the-work-done kind of people. Um, so all of these people, if you look at them, would be a representation of all of the people that I'm speaking to today, including myself. They would have been a, a sample of society that God, was, that God would use to rebuild the ancient ruins of, of Jerusalem, the temple, the walls, and they would eventually rebuild the city the way we have it today. They were called by God. Not everyone left Babylon. In fact, today, if you go and read the story about Iraq and Iran, you would read the story that there are still some Jewish people, pockets of Jewish people. And in the 70s, many of them left Iran, which was probably the place where, ba where Babylon was at that stage. So now, Many of these people left because they felt called by God. Ordinary, ordinary families. Great leaders. Great spiritual leaders. Now I want to ask you the question this morning before I start. Have you ever felt that God tapped you on the chest like that? I remember as a 13-year-old being in a prayer meeting and just hearing the voice of God. I was the youngest by far in the prayer meeting. I'm not sure why I went to the prayer meeting, but... In the middle of that prayer meeting, I had such an encounter with God that I knew that God wanted me. He, he spoke clearly to me that He wanted me in full-time ministry. Now, it would take about 10 years for me to actually go into full-time ministry after that. But I remember that night like yesterday. And I'm sure that many of you um, felt, have felt God say something to you. It might have been that you need to speak to someone. It might have been that you need to be a better father. God wants you to be a father up here or a mother up here or that God has made, God has gifted you to be a businessman, to make money um, or that you're an educationist, somebody, a teacher that will help children to, to set them up for success in life. Um, 
That's the way that God works. Now, out of this passage, I have one question to ask you, and it's this, this question. What is the one thing that keeps you, that the one thing that Satan would do, or the one thing that Satan would use to keep you from filling your God-given calling? Now, if you can look at this particular passage, it's very interesting. Joshua is actually passive throughout, the, throughout this particular um, chapter. I mean, he's just, he's just been spoken about. Zechariah has this vision of Joshua. And, and he's, he's, he's not doing anything except if you read the whole chapter, you would see that he got himself terribly dirty. And in the prophecy that God gives Zechariah, um, there is Satan. And, um, and he stands before God, and he says to God, my translation, he says to God, have you noticed how dirty Joshua is? Get the symbolic language there. Because why would Satan go and talk to God about Joshua's dirty clothes? It's much more than that. He's actually saying, if you read it from beginning to end, you'll see that Satan goes, you know what, Joshua is not all that he's, he is made out to be. Have you noticed that Joshua, you know, there's times when Joshua does this, and there's times when Joshua does that. And did you notice, and all of that should disqualify him from being able to do what you've called him to do, rebuild the walls of, of, of the temple and put the roof on and, and reinstitute worship. Now that's how Satan works. He's called the accuser. In the book of Revelation 12, for example, Satan's called the accuser. Um, he's called the accuser of the brethren in an old Bible version, which gives you the impression that Satan will do whatever he can to get God to change his mind about you or about me. Um, and, I mean, he'll do it like this. God, do you see? It's like, it's like those two kiddies on the playground. One kid does something and the other kid runs off to his parents and goes, have you seen so-and-so has done this? Have you seen so-and-so has done that? And, and I, I'm sure the conversation with God went something like this. You're going to let this guy build the church? You're going to let this guy build the temple? Really? And as I've already said, by the way, this is a pattern in the Bible. I mean, that's what Satan does. But Satan does more. Um, I think Satan also affected the way that Joshua saw himself. I mean, I, I, have you ever had a feeling of inadequacy when you think about being a father that honors God and adequate, adequately re reflect the glory of God into the lives of your children? Or, or, or have you ever thought that you could be a great husband and you get it right for a week or two and then you say that one thing that you wish, if anything, you could just rewind, erase, and start again, but you can't do that. And then for weeks afterwards, you walk around feeling guilty, feeling bad. Have you ever felt like this? I think I've been in that place. Look in the mirror. Satan comes and says, Rian, won't you look in the mirror? Have a good look. Have a good look. Um, can you see what I see? And if we're all really honest with our souls, we know exactly who we are. And that's exactly what Satan wants us to do. The other day I was, I was talking to a psychologist and um, we were just talking about all his patients and so on. And one of the things that he said to me was, um, Rian, most of my patients come and see me and they have severe disorders because of guilt in their own lives. And that is exactly what Satan wants to do. Now, he has the terrible truth about this. Um, for once, Satan was actually telling the truth. The Bible says he was telling the truth. Um, in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, Paul quotes a psalm that goes like this. There is none righteous, no, not even one. And by implication, what that means is, Joshua was not worthy. So if, if, if Satan went to Joshua and said, you think you can rebuild the walls? of the temple and put the roof on and reinstitute worship. I mean, I know who you are and you know who you are. He wasn't worthy. 
And the Bible says that's true. He wasn't worthy. And, and from the passage, if you unpack it, and you, you think about Zechariah standing in, there's Joshua. He's like passive. He doesn't have anything to say. His clothes are dirty and so on. And God does a cleaning up exercise on him that we'll get to now, which means he couldn't speak to God being as dirty as what he was. And so this thing must have affected his relationship with God. But as we'll see a little bit later on in the passage, probably affected his relationship with others. I mean, let's be honest. When you're feeling bad about yourself and terrible about something that you've done, it's very hard for you to relate in a loving, kind, caring kind of way with the people around you. And then most of all, I think Satan just nailed his self-confidence. Now, some people are incredibly self-confident in business, but they don't like who they are. They don't like who they are. And then we take this chapter. So that's what Satan does. He, he tries to break down our image with God, and he tries to break down the way we feel about ourselves so that his, our relationship with God is inhibited and our relationship with other people are inhibited. inhibited. But then there is God. Listen to what this Bible passage said. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuked you, Satan. I mean, this is God saying, basically saying, Satan, shut up. The Lord rebukes you, Satan. In, indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is this not a, a man, a firebrand snatched from the fire? And I mean, just that passage um, tells me something about the heart of God. I mean, first of all, we see God wants to restore Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was destroyed because people didn't live up to God's precepts. And God withdrew His protective hand. So um, God wants to. He tells King Cyrus, He touches the hearts of all of these people, over 40,000 of them, go back to Jerusalem and, and go and rebuild the temple. But God doesn't just want to rebuild Jerusalem. He wants to use imperfect Joshua. Now the one thing that has always mesmerized me about the church, and, and remember I have 40 years of experience. It sounds like a lot of, lot of time, but... I have 40 years of experience in local churches. I have seen all of the messiness of local churches. And the one thing that has mesmerized me about the church is that God would take this messed up group of people, put them together, and somehow rebuild, change communities, touch the lives of people. Then I, I would ask, I honestly still ask the questions at times. Why would God use us? We're all so messed up anyway. But it's God's way. It's the way that God does. So let's carry on reading. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy garments as he stood before the angel. Now there's symbolism here. In other words, Joshua was not worthy. And the angel of the Lord being spoken here, to translate it into today, to say the angel of the Lord is actually was God, was Jesus. Okay. Now it says this, Now the angel was dressed in filthy garments. Sorry, now Joshua was dressed in filthy garments as he stood before the angel. So the angel said to those standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. This is God saying. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have removed your, not your dirty clothes, but your iniquity, I will clothe you with splendid robe. Again, we see God's heart. God doesn't want you just to fulfill your purpose. God doesn't just want you to give money to the church. God doesn't just want you to serve. God doesn't want just you to just take somebody a meal or, or help us to build the next building here at the church. God wants to clean you up. God wants you to stand in His presence completely clean, completely confident, and God wants you to have incredible relationships. But no more about that in a minute. Ze Zechariah gets so excited about all of this that he gets in on the act. Listen to 
Listen to what he writes. He says, Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. He's speaking to the angel of the Lord who is God. He's kind of like, God's busy cleaning up and Zechariah chips in and he goes, there's a little bit of a comical part here where he goes, God, um, they've forgotten the guy's hat. And so a clean turban was placed on his head and they clothed him as the angel of the Lord stood by. It was like saying, um, God, you, uh, I think they missed a spot. <laughs> the heart of God, God wants it all clean. And you know what? When we start to understand the heart of God in the way that Zechariah was experiencing there, we would love to get in on the act. So from the passage, again the question, what is the one thing that keeps people from fulfilling their God-giving calling? What is the one thing that is that keeps people from fulfilling their God-given calling. And I, I'm about to say a word that's almost become a swear word. There's a lot of swear words that become acceptable these days. And this, day, this word was said many times in the past, but today it seems to be a swear word. The Bible calls it sin. For Joshua to completely fulfill his destiny, what God had created him for, for, for what God wanted him to be, God had to deal with the sin in his life. So let's read together. Then the Lord, the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord of hosts says. If you walk in my ways and keep my instructions, then you will govern my house and will also have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place amongst those these who are standing here. Who are these standing here? They were people in the temple. And again, we pick up God's heart. It is God's desire for us to fulfill what God wants us to do. But God has to deal with the sin. And God says this. He says, if you walk in my ways, if you are obedient. That, Jesus said that. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Now, this is not so that you can be better, so that you can earn your way to heaven. I mean, I've already read from Romans 3 verse 10, which tells us that none of us are righteous. But, but, but what, what God is saying to Joshua is, I have, I have called you to govern the house. I have called you for this. I have call, I've called you to be a business. I've called you to be a father or mother. I've called you to be a teacher. I have called you... To, to be all of these things. But if, if you do not walk in my way, you will not fully fulfill that calling. You will always be walking with a limp. And you will always be self-conscious. And you will never fulfill it completely because I haven't cleaned you up. You can try to do these things that God wants you to do. But if you feel dirty, if you are dirty, it is not the same. You will always feel awkward in God's presence. And hey, you'll feel awkward in God's presence, but let's add what this Bible passage says. For the first time, God includes other people. If you walk in my ways and keep my instructions, then you will govern my house. That is your calling. And also have charge of my courts. That is your calling, Joshua. And I will give you a place among these who are standing here. If you walk in my ways, it will affect relationships about, around you, Zechariah. And you will have a place amongst you standing here. This is God's heart. And the great thing about the story and this chapter is, is it's, it's not as if, I mean, it, God isn't waiting for us to respond. God is proactively entering in. He's, Joshua is just standing there. He is paralyzed like many of us are paralyzed in the middle of our sin, in the middle of our, in the middle of the things that we've done wrong and things that we can't forgive ourselves for. But God's heart is that we will fulfill our calling and be in wonderful relationship with the people around us. And, may, and maybe, maybe I should mention a few things that affect the way that we do our calling, the thing that God has called us to. I mean, if, if, if we are rude, if, if we are 
become jealous, if we are envious, interesting, the Bible calls being envious of something the same as idolatry. In other words, you are worshipping another God. If we are sexually immoral, immoral, I can carry on. If we are materialistic in our orientation, all of those things weigh us down and, and we miss out on fulfilling the complete calling that God wants us to have. And think about all of those things. You know, if I'm rude, if I'm, if I'm materialistic, if I'm all of those things, they affect how we relate to people around us. And God wants us to fulfill the calling, but not just the calling, to be in great relationship with each other. Now, if there's one thing that COVID has taught us, it's this, that relationships are incredibly important. So let's carry on. Zechariah writes, he says, Hear now, O high priest Joshua, you and your companions seating, seated before you, who are indeed a sign, for behold, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone that I have set before Joshua. On that one stone are seven eyes. Now, the thing with sin is, and iniquity, and we see that Joshua is like paralyzed in this picture. He's dressed in the dirty clothes. He's got a dirty turban on his head, which is a hat. It's not, not quite a cap, but something like that. And it, it's dirty. And, and Joshua actually um, actually doesn't know what to do about this. And, and in, this, in this vision, God says to Zechariah, tell Joshua, I'm making a plan. I am making a plan. And if you go to the New Testament, listen to what it says here, Old Testament. I am going to bring my servant the branch. Go to the New Testament. You will see that Jesus is often referred to as the branch. And the interesting thing about this is, if we thought that this chapter was all about Joshua, we would miss one of the gems in this chapter. Because li Listen to what it says a little bit further on. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of... Whoa, hang on now. This is not Joshua, just Joshua. I will re remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, you will each invite your neighbor to sit under your own vine and fig tree. Interesting how this ends. I mean, God doesn't just remove Joshua's sin. He removes the nation. He's, he's wanting to remove the nation's sin. And, and, and this is the way that it will end. You will sit under your own vine. This is what they did back then. You will sit around your own bride place or on your own stoop with your friends and it would be wonderful. Wonderful. So God's intent isn't just to remove Joshua's sin. God's intent is peace with God. God wants you to be at peace with Him. Joshua, let me clean you up. I'm scared to use some names because there might be people online who, who think that I'm now mentioning them specifically, but may, let me use my own name. Rian, let me clean you up. Rian, let me, let me clean you up so that you and I can have peace, so that when you, when you go out into your day with all of the pressures and all of the challenges that you have, you have my peace in your heart. You know this, that things between you and I are, are, are cool, are right. And, and, and Rian... Let me clean you up so that I can put you amongst other people so that when you are with other people, that they would, in, they would enjoy being with you and you would enjoy being with them. Now, I know this is not true for many people. I mean, we read, Joshua, if you want to build, I need to clean you up. Rian, if you want to be a father, a grandfather, if you want to be the pastor of Eastside Community Church in the way that I have called you to be, I have placed a calling on your life, Rian. If you want to be that person that I want you to be, I'm going to need to clean you up. If you want to lead Eastside Community Church, Rian, I need to clean you up. 
The Bible makes lists. I've given a list early on. It speaks about bitterness, anger, resentment, adultery, stealing. And you can add to the list. I know that the Spirit of God is speaking to some of you. What is that one thing? We, we had the question out there. What is that one thing in your life that is keeping you from fulfilling the calling that God has on your life and keeping you from having the kind of friendships that God and relationships that God wants you around yourself? So God had to clean Joshua up. And today He wants to clean you up. And you know, as I always say, it's not that complicated. I just love the way that God, throughout the Bible, people says in the Old Testament, you know, they love the God of the New Testament, which means they miss the joy of seeing God of the Old Testament. Well, here in the Old Testament, we see God showing the initiative. God's saying, I want to clean you up, man. And you know, it's not that complicated. Jesus the branch died so that it's not that complicated. And it happens in the Bible. It says this. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. And what I'm worried about is that some of you are sitting watching the screen right now and you're thinking to yourself, you know, this is a great message for those who don't know the Lord. But the interesting thing is this particular passage and this chapter isn't written to those who don't know the Lord. It's written to the believers in Jerusalem. It is written about Joshua who is the high priest. And I want to venture to say that there are many believers out there today who are not experiencing the fullness of God, living out the incredible calling that God has placed on their lives, enjoying the friendships that God wants them, them to enjoy because they've been caught up in this thing where they're standing like Joshua with everything that's dirty and the accuser of the brethren is accusing them in front of God. And, and maybe, they, maybe you have failed so many times that you've become numb to it and the net result of that is you're just living an ordinary life because you have a dirty garment. You have a dirty turban. You have iniquities. You have sin. Iniquity equals sin that God wants to deal with. God says this is how you deal with it. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so before I tell you how to do this, maybe just a quick one. Some of you have never heard this message like this. And you're online. You have never, ever prayed a prayer of forgiveness. And this is God reaching out to you. Like He's reaching out, reached out to Joshua. He is reaching out to you and He's saying, let me clean up your life. And all it takes is the willingness to confess your own sin. and Stand before God and say, God, I have sinned. And it's a simple prayer like this. Let me, let me pray the prayer. Maybe you need to pray a prayer like this. Lord, I have sinned. I've sinned because I've done things that I shouldn't have done. And God, I've, I have not done things that I should have done. And God, I pray that you will forgive me. I thank you that you sent Jesus to make a way. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will come and clean out my life and let my life be a picture like we see of the life of Joshua who rebuilt the temple. Help me to help, clean me up, God, so that I can fulfill the calling that you have in my life. Clean me up, God, so that I can do what you've called me to do. Clean me up, God, so that I could have great relationships with my wife and my children, for the people at work. God, I pray that you would clean me from the things that I can't even see. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, that's a simple way of praying, but you can do it on your own. You know that 
And here's what I want to encourage you to do before I say, before I, before I say goodbye. I want to I want to suggest that you actually go and make time to spend with God. This this afternoon, husband and wife maybe give it, take the children so that each of you get a chance. If you're a young adult, find a quiet spot, take out a piece of paper on your iPad, on your phone or something, and say, Holy Spirit, here I am. Whatever you bring to mind, I'm going to write it down. And write it all down. Don't rush the process. Let God really tell you what He thinks. And when you've done that, when you've done that, then what you do is um, you go and you take that piece of paper or whatever you've typed out, you go and kneel somewhere at a chair or something and you, you pray through each one of these things. God, I confess. I confess first that there's bitterness in my life. I confess resentment. I confess that I've stolen I confess that I've been sexually immoral. I confess, I confess, I confess. And when you've done all of that, I want to encourage you to take this verse and to write it over the whole page. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to purify us from all unrighteousness. You know why I want you to do that? Because the accuser of the brethren is the, accu is the accuser. The last thing that he wants, God will forgive you. But the last thing that Satan wants you to do, you to do is to feel forgiven. And that is a practical way in which you can feel forgiven. Take that piece of paper, tear it up, throw it in a dustbin. And say, God, I'm ready now. I'm ready now to do the thing that you've called me to do. The Lord bless you. And we'll see you online next Sunday. And guys, I am praying for you as a church. The Lord bless you. Wow, what a great word from Pastor Rian. I just want to, I want to take a moment to encourage you to do something. If this has spoken to you in some way, or perhaps maybe um, you feel as if this might be a word that you could share with someone else, why don't you do that? You can find um, this link on our YouTube channel, Eastside Community Church. you find us there. Find the link, share it with someone that you are close to, uh, and perhaps maybe even watch it later in the week so that you can allow the Word of God to sink deeper into your hearts. Hey, if you're a parent of little children, we have got the children ministry video that is going to come up straight after I close right now. And so I want to encourage you, grab your kids quickly, bring them to the TV, allow them to enjoy um, what our pastor Robin has prepared, our, our children's pastor has prepared for you guys. Hope it's a blessing to you guys as a community. And we will see you again next week, wherever you find yourselves. God bless and goodbye. Good morning, Esai Explorers. Today we're going to learn about the parable of the wise and foolish builder. Our parable today is from Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Now to try and help tell the story, I thought I would give it a go and try and build the houses just like the men in the story that Jesus is telling. So let's head out outside. Okay, kids, here I am with my sand and rock. Let's see what Jesus had to say. And Jesus said, anyone who hears my voice and builds a house upon a rock is like a wise, wise man. So here is my house on a rock. And then it says, and the rain came down and the winds blew. So I don't have any wind, but I'm going to try and have some rain with my watering jug. Ugh. But the house didn't fall down because the foundations are strong. See, my house is still standing. Then Jesus said, anyone who hears my word but does not put it into practice is like a foolish man who builds a house on the sand. Let me build my house on the sand. There we go. It's on the sand. And then again, the rains came down and the winds blew. Let's see what happens to my house on the sand when I pour all the water on it.
and it fell with a great crash. My little sandy house didn't stand a chance. When Jesus finished telling the story, the people were amazed. Not only because it was a great story, but because he told it with such authority. Let's go inside and find out what the final thought is all about. So as we grow up and build our daily lives, we are building our lives just like you'd build a house. So if we are building up this big house that is our lives, then we need to make sure that we have strong foundations at the bottom. We need to make sure we are building it on Jesus, who is the rock. But how do we do that? Well, Jesus said that whoever hears his word and puts it into practice is like the wise man. So let's listen to what Jesus' word says and put it into practice. So we shouldn't just think about loving our neighbor and then ignore them and be mean. We should love our neighbor. You know, just because you listen about Jesus doesn't mean that you're a Christian. There are people that go to church and listen to what Jesus is saying, but they don't do anything about it. They may as well be building their house on sand. If we want to build our house upon the rock, then we need to act upon what we have heard. And we have to actively choose to follow Jesus and invite him to be a part of our lives. For today's prayers, let's ask God to help us to build our house on a solid foundation. And as we pray, we can use our hands to help us build our lives. We can point to our ears to listen, and we could put our hands out as we put things into practice. Dear Lord, help us to build our lives upon you. Help us to listen to your word and put them into practice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, hasn't this story been so fun, kids? Why don't you go and try and build your own house on rock and on sand and see which one stands the taste of rain. I hope you have a great week and I'll see you soon. Bye. In the morning and I wiggle my toes, wiggle my toes. Oh, oh. I stretch out my arms and I'm scratching my nose, scratching my nose. Oh, oh.